evening. Thank you, Nate, for the introduction. Uh, and I want to thank all of you who are joining us online tonight. It's a real honor to have everybody interested in this panel discussion uh, and a topic that's so timely uh, in our city right now. Um, I'm going to ask that you all please use the question and answer function in your browser in your uh, Zoom chat function so that any questions that we have, we will answer at the end of the session um, with a Q&A session. I should also uh, disclaim that I have a dog and a small child, so it is possible that you will meet one or both of them at some point during this evening. So I hope that uh, we're not disturbed, but it's a, an entire possibility now in this uh, online virtual space. Um, Nate, thank you so much for the introduction. I actually am gonna get right into the panel tonight. I, I wanna spend as much time as we can talking with our panelists, Bang Dang, Lawrence Agu, and Julia Lindgren. So I'm hoping that you have all had a chance to read their bios and the information that's gone out prior to this um, panel discussion. But hopefully we can just dive right in. I'm going to break this up into four sections. Uh, rather than asking specific questions, we were chatting a little bit yesterday about how we should structure the, the topic here. And I'm here to say that none of us are advocating that we get rid of our single family homes. So if you were worried about that, you can log off. I think that you're safe for the time being. Um, but I think that it's no secret that Dallas is changing really fast. And uh, Lawrence is gonna speak a little bit more about what's happening in the city, but the way our city looks is changing and that's due to a variety of factors. Uh, so what we have always seen as a, single a culture of single family homes is rapidly starting to shift. So I attended a fantastic conference in my new profession now, which is museums. And I went to the American Alliance of Museums conference, national conference, and the keynote speaker was Thomas Friedman, who's the New York Times economist uh, opinion writer. And I got a great quote from him, which was, now is the time to understand more so that we can fear less. And that's really been guiding my thinking as we've been discussing this panel. And so, as we get into this conversation, I'm really hopeful that we can explore all of this together. We can be curious about the questions that come up. We have an obligation to all live with each other and serve each other well. And so I'm just hoping that in understanding more about what's happening in our city, we can not be afraid about the changes that may come and we can embrace whatever we need to do to, um, to coexist. So that's my, my spiel before we get started. So thank you panelists for joining us. Um, if we can go ahead and get started with the history of land use and single family housing in Dallas, Lawrence, I'm going to have you sort of kick us off um, since you're with the city and you can give us a little bit of context here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kate. And I think um, just kind of preface uh, as being from the city. I was like, oh, you're from the city, so you're going to know everything about it and fix our problems. Uh, well, that will kind of put us in the particular context that I'm in a particular team kind of focused on land use development, um, especially what's happening with Fort Dallas and our comprehensive plan update. So my comments will be kind of focused on that because that's, that's what I know. Uh, when it comes down to specific types of housing policy, I can reference uh, those particular departments and what we're doing there. So I just want to also just preface that beforehand, kind of wish I was a professor like bang, bang, just kind of just say whatever, I'm joking. Um, so I think with what's happening on the um, the land use side, kind of thinking about history, I'm not gonna go from like what happened in the beginning from when John Neely Brown founded the, the city in the 1940s to now, but I think there are some important pieces just to think about. So one, um, when uh, development started to happen within the city, just kind of fast forward, not fast forward, but going back into time around the, the 1920s and 30s, it's important to note that uh, what was happening federally in the city, uh, just related to just um, equity in terms of race equity and, and that kind of issue, that overtone, that's important to note because at that time when uh, certain land use policies were being developed, um, there's a kind of overtone of you know separation of races in the city. Uh, that was occurring, um, I think, in in the 30s, there was specific cases and kind of um, legislation passed that basically authorized um, separation of races 
in the city. So that's one, one, one piece to note that was happening during time. And the other piece I want to also um, highlight that's important in terms of land use in the city is the idea of cumulative zoning. So for those who are not like zoning nerds, um, cumulative zoning, it kind of there's a hierarchy in, in how zoning works. So basically from high to low. So high, that's basically single family type of uses and low, that is um, industrial uses. So with cumulative zoning, what that entails is that um, those in the higher kind of classes can be allowed in the lower classes, but the vice versa can happen. So basically single family could happen in the lower, I guess, quote unquote, lower uses, which were industrial, um, but you can't have industrial like plant built in a residential neighborhood. So because we had that, uh, those two things are taking place throughout our history, um, kind of basically up until, up until the 80s. Um, that kind of has led to where we have these kind of discrepancies in terms of uh, adjacencies with residential, with industrial, and all the other overtones with those happening racially in our city. Uh, again, I'm not going to delve too much into to the history, but that's the two pieces I wanted just to kind of leave with us that was kind of leading to where we are now. And then fast forwarding to where we are doing with Fort Dallas and our comprehensive plan update. Um, currently, there isn't a future land use map that dictates where things need to go in the city. So with all the history that I just mentioned, and then the fact that we don't have a clear understanding of where land uses should go, um, that makes it difficult in terms of just knowing or predicting how the future should look like. So uh, I guess with that, it's gonna kind of just pause in terms of that discussion, just as we kind of start to noodle about what's happened historically, and we can kind of start to put the pieces together in terms of our other panelists. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, before we move into talking a little bit about how the three of you, and I should mention Lawrence is with uh, the city of Dallas, Bang is with Far and Dang, a, um, a private practice in Dallas, and Julia has worked with BC Workshop in Hester Street and is now teaching at the University of Texas at Arlington. So I forewent the, the formal introductions, but I should let everybody know who, who is with us. Um, I know that we'll start to get into conversations that involve the word affordable and especially in the context of affordable housing. So Julia, I was wondering if you or Lawrence could take a minute to just sort of lay out what we mean when we say affordable housing. Sure. I'll I'll start and then Lawrence, feel free to jump on in. I mean, affordable housing really in the context of the Dallas Metro is set largely in the way we talk about it in the, in the city and planning by HUD. So housing and urban development. So right now in the Dallas Metro area, um, affordable housing for a family of four is set at um, 89,000, I wanna say. And so that's kind of 100% AMI. That's your average. So when we're talking about affordability, you'll hear 80% AMI, 60% AMI, 30% AMI, low affordability, or sorry, high affordability. We're talking about a percentage of that $89,000 number. Um, and why that's important is because one, it's, it's setting kind of the standard for housing vouchers and then also housing subsidy. Um, so actually, you know, it's a conversation we have with uh, students all the time at UTA. It's something that we talk about all the time. And it's always is interesting to me when you say, what does affordable housing mean to you? And I think folks' biases, you're really thinking about either folks that are houseless um, or folks that have um, large amounts of subsidy kind of coming into their life. And it's really not the case. It's really, we're talking about working families. And so I think there's been a real shift recently to kind of use um, uh, working class housing, worker housing versus affordability. But I think, you know, becoming fluid and comfortable with both of those terms is certainly important as we go on. Yeah, I think to add to that, um, you mentioned that the, this preconceived notion of what that is, um, I, I'm glad you brought up AMI, um, the average median income, and how that kind of is part of the city's policy in terms of designating uh, where and how these are also added. So I think there's kind of more like specific types of uh, programs to kind of put affordable housing in new projects, but also those the naturally occurring affordable housing just based on where it is in the city. And I think both of those are affordable housing. So I think um, those two together, um, we want to make sure that we are kind of dispelling some of these notions about what it looks like. There's no look 
So for housing, you're just making sure that the housing that we are providing um, kind of can get to those particular um, uh, individuals who fall into that particular bracket uh, based on the city. So each, each city has their own particular, you know, bracket and it's kind of from the top from the from federal level or state level when it comes to the city depending on who's who's approving what but um, I'm glad that Linda mentioned that that that's kind of how we look at it the city there's a certain um, um, income bracket and then based the percentage of that um, determines the type of affordability that we're, we're offering in the city and I think partially like why it becomes such a hot topic with single family is single family you know, going back to what Lawrence was saying earlier about zoning, these decisions around exclusionary zoning or like really protecting single family neighborhoods um, and not allowing things like duplexes kind of in those spaces, it directly affects folks' ability to um, identify kind of where they're able to live, where they're able to move. And so it's a topic that is consistently linked, um, but not necessarily always the case. Right. Yeah, I was going to touch on that a little bit. Um, going back to the cumulative zoning, um, you know, our practice does a multitude of uh, housing typologies. And I wanted to comment on two things. Um, you know, it makes sense in the sense of where, um, you know, you can't, you can put a single family house for some reason if you wanted to in an industrial zone, but obviously you can't put a factory in a single family zoned area. But I was, I was wondering if there was any sort of um, thought in terms of experimenting with where if you're residential and given that you take care of other parameters like parking the vehicle and everything, that you can have mixed residential so that if you're in a single family zone area, you could put a duplex or you could put a single family in an ADU or something because that has so many benefits in some ways, right? One, I think having done an, enough of these at the office that there's a lot of creative solutions that are off the table when you are only able to do duplex or single family, et cetera. And I think in terms of the affordability, it also helps in that sense, because if there's an entire, if there's blocks and blocks of neighborhoods that are purely just single family and they're always a certain square footage, there's a certain amount of people in the market that can't afford that neighborhood. But if there's a single family home on the same lot that you have a smaller unit that's slightly attached that you could call it a duplex, then you can start to introduce other people who can perhaps live in that neighborhood. So that was just the thought based on some of the things that uh, Lawrence and Julia mentioned earlier. You know, and that that drives so much of the way our country searches for homes these days, which is by school, by elementary school. And so that naturally starts to increase the diversity of the students. It, it starts to make the neighborhood more affordable. And I, I think that this is actually a really good segue into the second part of our talk, which is hearing a little bit from each of you about how you're thinking about single family typology in your work. And Bang, you had mentioned how you and Rizzi like to think about domesticity and migration patterns. And so I think based on what you were just talking about, that's a really good opening to, to start to talk about how you all think about these things in your work. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I feel like really Julie and Lawrence are the experts here. So uh, I'm just kind of tagging along, but uh, yeah, we, we try to think about that because it's important to what we do. Um, but the first thing I'll say about that is it's, you know, we always have to be really careful at the office that you're not just spotting trends versus you're spotting something that's a little more long term. Because housing trends, whether uh, in, in a very general sense or to, to even minute details of, you know, what people like in terms of how they want to arrange program and space, those things come and go, um, but what we're trying to see ahead of, um, because we're very interested in housing in general as an office. And, um, you know, I actually did my uh, 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 master's thesis on that. So um, we're trying to spot things that are a little more long lived, right? So one easy way to start for us is how do you make things more affordable? and not just for a certain 
uh, economic class, but for every economic class, right? So, um, and, and then in terms of migration patterns, that almost came uh, by accident because a lot of our clients are from the West and East Coast, especially the West Coast. So we started to see, you know, we, we talk about in the office a lot, uh, you know, in, our, in, in sort of design terms, you always talk about context. But, you know, in, in sometimes in some ways, certain days we're, we're practicing and we realize the context, first of all, Dallas is not a super old city relatively. So, you know, it's very hard for people to say what the design context of Dallas is, right? I mean, when you think about shopping and restaurants and highways, but you don't really think of Dallas as, as a huge design context. But we, we started to think in some ways that's an advantage because some of the context is brought in from people who are moving here. And they're moving here in huge, huge volume. And so, um, you know, not a trend, but something I think that's gonna stay is that uh, things that we wanted to do uh, when we first started out, uh, um, aesthetically and design-wise, uh, we, we weren't getting much traction because of a lot of people moving here from the East and West Coast, we are able to do. And, but, but, but not just aesthetically, but the way they live. And that, that's kind of what we're trying to tap into, you know? Do you yeah, have, I think, oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead I, was gonna, I was gonna kind of just jump in from like the more macro level, like as uh, Bang is talking about those coming uh, to the city. Uh, what we're looking at is that there's a lot of people coming to the city. Uh, you know, probably 20,000 in the next few years. And we're, we're thinking like, where are we going to put those people? Um, just the way that the land composition is set up now um, with how, you know, the amount of single family land is designated, we're going to have to think about a, a more denser approach to accommodating um, all the influx of people that are coming. Uh, so Texas uh, as a state has pretty good, like lax um, land use policies, and that's attractive to others who come in from uh, the different coasts in terms of developing what's happening, in terms of their cost of living. There's a lot of benefits that they see here from a land, land development perspective that's very attractive. Um, and also too is important from, from our perspective as we're kind of looking at the land use update, um, how are we gonna fit all those people in that influx and that um, estimated growth into our existing uh, setup um, that's going to have to do with land use. Like, how do we play with the land use um, uh, composition? And that's where we kind of start thinking about okay, within these lower, denser areas, it's not either or, it's not low denser, density or high density. That's kind of what we see sometimes. I was kind of playing with that in between middle um, growth of density of how we kind of bring more uh, housing to these areas, but in a way that doesn't destroy. Uh, the particular fabric and nature and, and understanding of, of a, a particular um, way of life in a particular city or uh, neighborhood in the city. So I think that's one piece that I wanted to touch on, Bang, is that as growth is happening and we're looking to um, accommodate that, we have to think through a land use perspective, like how are we going to like actually accommodate the amount of people coming to the city? And Julia, I think that you've been doing a lot of work in this sphere. Um, personally and with your students, is that right? Yeah, I mean, we've been thinking a lot about, you know, what Lauren said, this missing middle, and it's really like, where where is density gonna happen and how can we strategically increase density in areas and just fill out neighborhoods of high vacancy? So if you're looking at high opportunity neighborhoods and you knowing Dallas geography, it tends to be the Northern sector of the city, areas that are in close proximity, um, to job centers, to transit, to high performing schools, things like that. That's the area of the city that um, has more fully developed and built out single family lots. So how in those areas can we um, insert, you know, some light additional density without changing the context or the feeling of the space, right? To open up those opportunities to folks that otherwise are priced out right now. And then conversely, how are we building out um, areas of the city that have really high vacancy rates? So Southern sector, I, I think uh, the last I saw 18% of the city's buildable land is vacant. That's a huge number. So if we're just to see build out right now on all of the single family zoned lots in the city, 
that alone, I think, would get us to the density that we've been talking about at a city, which is 20,000 units, which is the number that's kind of been held by the city since 2018 anyways as the guiding mark. I'm sure it's probably shifted a little bit um, with current context. But I think it, we're not talking about a drastic rehaul um, or the collision of, um, you know, high density, high rises in single family. We're talking about gentle and intentional insertions. And then perhaps, you know, thinking about the transition zones between single family neighborhoods where they do abut up um, to multifamily and how can we kind of further densify those areas um, kind of as a interstitial zone. How has that work been received, generally speaking, um, as you've sort of begun to introduce it? I will say um, communities we've been working with in the Southern sector, so areas where there's higher vacancy levels, they wanna see lots filled, right? They wanna see infill lots developed for um, single family, for duplexes. A lot of these older neighborhoods to go back to kind of being what you were saying earlier are actually great examples of middle medium density, like neighborhoods like Junius Heights and others. There's many, many that have grandfathered in duplexes or manor home style apartments, which is kind of, you know, a single family that might've been converted into four units. And so I think learning from some of the context that is already in some of these places is being well received by those neighborhoods. And then I think there's other neighborhoods that have more hesitancy and even just as a citizen participating in community meetings in my neighborhood, you hear a lot about concerns about traffic patterns and increased cars. And I do kind of wonder if we're all understanding like what, what are we saying when we say increased density for a lot of the um, residential zoning that we have right now in the city, it's actually a pretty healthy density. So I think we can look to some, some areas within our own context um, for, for guiding cues. All right, I love the fact that you brought transportation into the mix. Um, I think land use and transportation, they're, they're kind of tied to the hip, I think. Um, and that's important as we think about city of Dallas, we have this unique uh, thing called DART. <laughs> we have transit in the city. And I think as we start to think about kind of these specific either focus areas throughout the city that could increase density, uh, these transit nodes that we have populated throughout the city or those are those are prime areas to think about you know increasing that density because um, when you think about just from a efficiency standpoint the way that the city is set up whenever you do have denser um, type of development or along transit nodes um, that just makes kind of um, serving that population just more efficient the way it is with transportation and connecting with single family from a transportation perspective just talk to our engineers they'll say that's not the most efficient way of serving the population. And if we're gonna be serving an increased population, uh, we also start, need to start looking at how transportation, transit kind of ties into the land use composition that we're looking to, to update and tweak uh, throughout the city. I mean, like that makes me think of incentives, right? Like incentives, cert certainly like transit-oriented development is a thing we talk about. So incentives there, you might, if you're building in proximity to a transit hub, you might get a forego or a variance on the parking requirements, right? And I think in some of the neighborhoods that are uh, more densely built out, higher opportunity, we have to kind of think about what are the incentives um, to get higher density in those areas that aren't going to necessarily be driven by the market alone, right? Because the market we know is producing a certain trajectory. And so given fair housing and some of the, the context around equitable housing that were required by law to do, I think we need to start thinking about how are we incentivizing development, development in these areas where it's not just going to naturally occur. And I think, too, the, the one, one area that doesn't get enough, um, it seems like, attention is, you know, when we talk about density and affordability, we still mostly talk about the center of the city. Um, but we don't talk about, um, you know, the continued growth of pushing outwards still. Um, and, and I'd be curious, uh, Lawrence and Julia, if uh, you've done some research on this, but, you know, COVID aside, it seemed like there were a decade where people were moving back to the center of the city, right? Things like uh, West Village, Mockingbird Station started to pop up. And uh, there was this wave of uh, duplexes and triplexes in East Dallas. Um, 
But at the same time, we forget that even though that's happening, other folks are still more than the folks moving back to the city. Other folks are still pushing further out, right? South Lake, uh, McKinney, Allen. And um, is that just, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm asking a question. I don't know. Is that, is that trend going to continue? Um, or is that something that we say, hey, that's the suburbs. We're going to worry about this kind of radius here. And, uh, you know, we're going to infill and insert or I, I'm, I'm always curious because, um, you know, we do work out in the burbs and we do work. Well, in and, Dallas, and so before either of you answers that question, there's there is a question that popped up that I think is somewhat relevant to this asking about the amount of PDs that are in the neighborhood in Dallas that make it very difficult to do exactly what we're discussing. And so what is the how do we start to address these problems when zoning makes it so difficult to even try these things out? Right, so I guess I'm gonna touch on your question and then Bang's question and then we kind of open it up again. So kind of just from just planning nerding speak, whenever you have um, kind of an abundance of PDs, that is indicative of the base zoning not working the way it should work. So if there isn't a base category zoning that kind of just fits in the particular development you're trying to do, um, then the default is to go to basically a PD to kind of make that work. So in, in the city of Dallas, that is an issue that we know about in terms of how do we reform our zoning code to be able to be more adaptable and predictable um, to development that comes in. So I think um, the amount of PDs in our city is well, maybe, a, I just want to I don't speak out of term because I'm not the current planner, um, but it's more than um, like 20%. It's, it's a lot of land dedicated to um, PDs. And Which, that's- and, and sorry, a PD is a- Plan Development District. I'm sorry, thanks for using all these terms and acronyms. And stuff. <laughs> sorry, sorry to anybody who is not. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so typically, uh, cities are kind of made up of uh, a suite of zoning categories. And just for just from uh, some knowledge, zoning is basically the the policing enforcement tool uh, to ensure or kind of um, implement land use vision. So typically how it works, um, a city comes up with a vision for their land use called a comprehensive plan. And from that particular plan document, that's not a policing tool, but that's the vision from the city. Um, from, from that, um, zoning categories are, are developed um, to basically enforce and police that vision um, into our built environment. So whenever that particular zoning code um, isn't written well or it doesn't allow for uh, either flexibility or kind of getting to that uh, development that needs to be done, then a PD, a planned uh, development district, PD, a planned district, whatever you want to call it, um, is then used to kind of like create what that, that idea is. So that's kind of what's one piece to what you talked about, Kate, is that this PDs are in abundance in the city of Dallas just because I think our, our, code, our zoning code needs an update. Um, and hopefully that's kind of the process with Fort Dallas is to kind of get that clear vision. And then from that clear vision, we can kind of get a clear way of how do we now implement that vision um, into what we were looking at in the city. And then bang, it's gonna remind me of uh, the particular piece you're talking about related to your question. I think you said something about, it just remind me of your question again. Um, you know, do we just let the, do we include conversations about the, the suburbs continually to push out? Yeah. And, you know, okay. um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of put that all together because I know we're looking at just at the city of Dallas, but uh, the city of Dallas region works together. It's kind of this, this mega uh, city and this mega um, uh, anomaly of how uh, development happens. So I think people all over, depending on the density, still want connectivity. They want to be able to access certain amenities. Um, if you're talking about South Lake, if you're talking about these other districts that are cities are, are less dense. I think at the end of the day, they kind of want to be able to um, be connected and, and, and to these other amenities. So that's the piece that we have in our back of our minds that we want to make sure we allow different densities, but still connectivity as we do that. So I think that's the one, one piece that I, that came to mind is that connectivity is what kind of connects the dots in terms of um, the development happening in different scales. But I'm going to kind of just stop there because I can keep going for, for a while on that one. 
I mean, I think nationally, like the Pew just put out a study, I think nationally suburbs mm-hmm. are growing at like a far higher rate. I think it's like 56% of mm-hmm. everyone lives in this, sorry, suburb, not city. Did I say city? Um, suburbs are growing at the fastest rate. And so I think that trend is, it's going to continue. And I think mm-hmm. we can start to think about Dallas. I mean, it is a suburban pattern city. And so I think strategies that were applying to suburbs and the way we're thinking about those could also apply to Dallas neighborhoods. I, I think as we're considering what the future then as we move into phase three, we have about 20 minutes left before we can take some questions. Um, what the future is, going to the title of the panel, what is the future of single family housing? Um, and I think keeping it specific to Dallas, of course, we could uh, think all day long about national trends, but uh, Dallas in particular has had such a rich tradition of single family housing. Um, how how do you all see that evolving in, because like you're saying, Texas has worked really hard to make it, to make these economic incentives to bring people from the coast and it's worked really well. Uh, the problem is now we need to ha- find houses for all, of, for all of these people who have come and the suburbs can keep growing, but ultimately they will run into the same problems you know, land will run out at some point. So um, what do you all see the, the, not the solutions, but the advancements as we start to go forward? Bing, do you wanna start? Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch on, sure, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on a few things. Um, you know, going back to the PDs, I, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, Lawrence, but I, I've had to struggle through a bunch of PDs where the whole office has, and. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but supposedly Dallas has the most planned development districts than any other major city in the U.S. And and you're right. Um, I'm glad you're there because uh, you're trained as an architect and maybe you can update some of that because most of the times when we worked on PDs, they were actually more restrictive than non-PD zones. So it kind of went against um, what we were thinking. But um you know, I, I'm, I'm just really interested in, in uh, when you asked the question, Kate, about how do we, how do we uh, provide homes for everyone? I'm just wondering, if you, if you look at our, our uh, neighboring city, Houston, which a big part of it has no zoning at all, and I'm not sure I'm advocating that, but what if we don't, we don't, we don't talk about domestic city in terms of duplexes, triplexes, multifamily, uh, fee simple, uh, you know, condos versus townhomes. What if we just have a residential zoning? And there's other things, other parameters. For instance, I think scale is more important than how many units I put on a lot because scale affects my neighbor, right? Uh, my neighbor who's a one story little house doesn't want me to put a three story next to him or her. Um, so maybe the zoning should be more about maybe scale rather than uh, amount of square footage or, or units or, I don't know, I, I feel like that's one way, maybe within residential, there's no subcategory of zoning, right? Uh, I think that could be really interesting to try, even if you tried it on just a few blocks. Um, and then I'm just, um, yeah. I'm, I'm just, I would be very, it would be very interesting to see because, you know, the thing about Dallas I've noticed, which is not a trend because it's been around for a while. It's like when we talk about density, it's a very um, mixed use and somewhat uh, encapsulated village, right? Uh, I was really surprised how well legacy East and West worked. Like, if you told me, hey, we're going to develop this thing and people are going to come here, I was like, eh, maybe, maybe not. There's some businesses there, but it's worked really well. But it stays kind of contained, right? Same like West Village, same like Mockingbird Station. And so we have these kind of villages of dense communities. But I think it would be more interested, interesting, like Julia said, if you were able to insert them uh, like little dots everywhere. And, and, and see what happens, right? organically almost. 
Julia, do you want to follow that up? Yeah, I mean, like we said, kind of starting this off as a premise, I don't think that the future of Dallas single family housing is going to look drastically different. Like in my mind, we see, we see neighborhoods built out to higher density that are currently um, far under their build out requirement. And I think it's going to be a slow kind of transitional space where you're walking down the street and you don't necessarily actually recognize that the lots may have additional density than they did 10 years prior, but they do and it's working. And um, there might also be in an ideal world, perhaps a diversity of family types um, or folks in the neighborhood, right? So we're allowing um, kids who grew up in neighborhoods to return when they're adults um, to purchase homes or to gain uh, generational wealth through their investment, which we all, you know, home is still like the number one um, investment that folks have. And so I don't think it's going to look drastically different. That's not like a very, uh, you know, exciting answer, but I think, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be in subtle ways. And I think, um, yeah, again, I mean, I think context as Bing was saying is crucial. And I think there's many ways to do it um, across all residential zonings, R5 to um, R5 being like the smallest lot type that we have, which is like 5,000 square feet up until, uh, you know, the acreage lots, right, which are few and far between. Um, but I think opportunities um, to do that well and to do that in a way that doesn't change kind of like the feeling of place will be important. Yeah, I think two things I want to touch on. That's actually a really good point. Um, from the land use perspective, that's, that's what I'm over is kind of the predictability of where those are going to be located in the city. I think that's that helps uh, kind of two parties. That helps uh, the community in terms of that, that that they're in, knowing what type of development is going to happen in their backyard, in their you know front yard, etc. It also helps the development community know how to kind of plan for what, what, the, what the city is planning to do in the future, how to invest in our vision. So I think when we have something that's predictable, like we're trying to do with uh, for Dallas, just a more predictable land use vision, um, I think the, the categorization of single family, how it works, I think like Julie mentioned, I don't see that changing, but I think knowing exactly where um, those are gonna be located and the division for those, I think that's one piece. And I think after um, a land use vision is kind of done that everybody knows and kind of predicts, I think the next phase of that is kind of think, looking at our zoning, uh, which is not my expertise, but I think that's where we're looking to kind of move the conversation in our department is that, okay, how do we now rethink about these single family uh, zoning types? You mentioned from like R5 to R whatever we're going to put it. Maybe we start to think about redesigning those acreages and kind of thinking about what that looks like. Um, in the city moving forward. So that's kind of a, a future discussion um, that we're thinking about, but like from land use predict, predict, uh, predictability, I'm not sure how to say that. So what we're looking at from a zoning uh, piece, those tie together pretty, uh, pretty closely. Um, and I think that's gonna be a major play in terms of just how the current um, single family um, looks in the city and where we know it's gonna be. Maybe one thing to add to that would be, I would expand that to PDs as well. Uh, I think PDs probably are the ones, the areas of the city that are least regulated or the most um, deal driven. And so how can we kind of standardize um, what PDs are doing? It's an ask of the city. So what is the city getting in return? And I think that there are some creative opportunities there um, that neighborhoods um, can really request um, and demand. Yeah, I think it's a great conversation that the city is starting to really dive into and think about and have have um, especially concerning the PDs and the developers and how everybody can get something that's mutually beneficial instead of uh, you know seeing seeing some of the the patterns that we've seen so far. So I'm I'm so glad Lawrence that you're there doing this work because it's mm -hmm. uh, it's important. Um, we have just a few more minutes before we take a few questions. And I just want to encourage you, if you have a question, to please put it in the Q&A box instead of the chat box. Um, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can ask questions. And we'll try to get to a couple of them before we end the night. But because I'm going to maybe falsely assume, but I'm going to assume that the majority of our attendees this evening are probably architects or in the architectural realm. 
Um, I'm wondering if you all, as we start to wind down, can tell us what architects can do to think about single family housing um, in through the lens of, you know, again, just making it something that's accessible to as many people as, as we can as we can. And I'll open that up to anybody who wants to raise their hand first. Maybe I'll start. I think from the educational, from the university perspective, I think the more architects, kind of like Lawrence is a great example, the more architects are trained in urban policy, I think the better our cities will be moving forward. So I think kind of integrating um, urban planning with architecture, you know, Kappa here at UTA, I not give a plug, but I did that many years ago, right? So we're all under one college umbrella. And I think there is additional opportunities for collaboration in the university space that can then drive um, kind of into the field of practice in architecture. And then also, um, perhaps the obvious, but as architects, we're also citizens. And so I think not just, you know, running for office and things like that, but actually engaging in conversations with our neighbors. And I think that's where um, these topics are really understood and we understand one another. And so I think, you know, both getting involved locally, but also just having conversations with um, neighbors and, and kind of sharing the knowledge, um, certainly as trained architects and planners um, around this issue. Talking to your neighbors is always a good idea. Yeah. Um, you know, piggyback on Julia's comment, uh, but also add that having architects like Lawrence um, work in leadership roles in the city of Dallas helps. Uh, have some having someone do the do the PDs on the other side uh, helps. Um, I think for architects, um, you know, if we're going to be honest about this, uh, developers make a lot of decisions. Uh, uh, big time decisions. And I think uh, for architects who choose to work with developers, um, just like teaching in the classroom, it's uh, talking about value of things that uh, one may not get as much value if you reduce your square footage, but you may get value elsewhere, right? Maybe you can sell for more dollars per square foot because of the fact you have more green space or you fit in the neighborhood better, or you attract a certain type of tenant. Um, that's the toughest part. And I think that's really the only tool architects have because we are not the people funding the developments. So teaching value. Far from it. <laughs> right, exactly. I think a piece that I'll mention, um, kind of thinking about kind of the design piece and, and land use piece. So as we're uh, my plug is for Dallas. So as we're developing and updating for Dallas, there's two main components that we're trying to update, kind of the land use piece and the urban design piece. And how those come together is, is what I'm actually really excited about. I'm starting to develop place types um, to where basically you kind of have the infusion of design and land use typologies uh, throughout the city. So I think we're I think architects that kind of provide uh, a lot of utility and expertise is being able to be part of that those conversations because you see everything from a design perspective, like everything you do, even like how you set your computer on your desk, it just it has to be designed a particular way. And I think that kind of thoughtfulness about how design and land use come together and leads to a particular community or neighborhood, um, that's gonna be critical in terms of what we're doing moving forward for Dallas. And that's going to be what's going to happen, um, I guess, in around the next few months, actually, as you're talking about visioning place types in the city. So I think that's the piece I'll mention from my perspective, just knowing the skills on, on this call, uh, being involved with that particular phase of the project and other phases of the project as we start to kind of uh, flesh out what that looks like and how our city uh, is going to look like in the future. That's my plan. Excellent. Excellent answers. Um, we have time for probably just a couple of questions, which is too bad because there's some really good ones in the in the Q&A box. Um, one that I thought I'm going to ask a couple from um, non architects, actually. The first one, how can local media help communicate what was, what is, what is needed to Dallasites? What are we missing? Anybody have a, a good answer for that? I think it's a really interesting question. I think it's helpful to understand that 
the decisions we make today have real impact. And I think we can learn that from our history, like the single family predominant zoning um, that's directly driven out of planning that was done in the 40s, right? And so these things for good or for bad, however you might feel about them, um, are also happening in real time now. And so I do think that seeing kind of that continuity and having that story told through a narrative will be helpful in terms of understanding where we are today and how for Dallas and the opportunities that the city is going through right now can really set the trajectory um, for decades. Right, I think a, a major thing that I'm learning kind of observing is when you're in the city, um, not just looking at policy, but engaging the community um, one, listening to what they have to say about their area, um, and also, to having other people listen to what they're telling you. So just got this idea of storytelling, it's so huge. So we we love to be able to connect um, other communities, other communities, just to learn what uh, is happening. Uh, that way, we kind of actually grow together. There's diversity in that uh, type of storytelling, and we love that. So I think um, in terms of partnership with media, we want to be able to tell stories from other neighborhoods you know, in different ways through virtual means, media, television. Uh, so we're open to that because when we, I guess when we start to unveil actually the diversity in the city, we actually become more prideful about what we, wow, this is actually where I live. And you want to kind of foster that more so. So that's what we've seen. Um, the community loves to just learn about other people and other cultures. Um, when that information isn't known, you're kind of in your silo and you just kind of know what you know. So I think um, that's one piece of partnership with the city. Just we love to tell stories about other communities and other communities like to tell the, us their stories. So I think that's a good partnership. I love the idea of neighborhood residents telling the story, like right. flipping the script. So right. none of the three of us or four of us are telling the story, but it's folks from the community starting exactly. to tell these stories. I love that right. idea. Right. Um, another one from a non-architect uh, says, I might be an outlier, but how about custom home builders and what can we do? And I think that that is also an excellent question because we see so many of those here in Dallas. So what are your, all th what are your thoughts on those and their responsibilities? You know, I, I'll, I'll say this, I, um, you know, speaking of trends, it, it seemed like when we started our business in uh, 2011, there was um, a trend towards smaller homes, at least within the city. Uh, and it's creeped back up. Um, and this was even pre-pandemic, so we can't blame the pandemic for this um, uh, before people started working from home. It, it started to creep back up again, at least in our clientele. Um, you know, the most sustainable thing you can do uh, and the most affordable thing you can do really uh, when you're taking a case by case basis is uh, to build just what you need. And I think uh, builders actually have a huge stake in this because actually uh, architects, I think I read only do like 2% of the work out there. Uh, most people just go straight to a custom builder, right? Um, so, you know, maybe once again, I hate to talk about this again, it's, it's talking about value. It's the value of the square foot, not the quantity of the square foot sometimes. So, you know. And that does get into the discussion that we were having too about how you want perhaps to build smaller, but construction costs are, are prohibitive in that regard. And so it makes right. it more difficult. And mm -hmm. uh, so it just yeah. complicates things. Yeah, but usually Kate, when we've seen that is when you go really small you know, so like a thousand square feet or something. So okay. usually if you're still in the range of what one would typically think of as a single family home, that that difference is not too great. You can still manage, you know, um, but it's just really telling people, you know, you just don't need that big of a home, honestly. Yeah. Well, we're right bumping up against 7.30 and so, I am going to let you all go, but I really want to tell you how much I appreciate this talk because it was informative, it was informed. Um, you all are very optimistic, which I appreciate and very knowledgeable. So thank you all so much for participating tonight. Everybody, please look up these three great people and their work and um, please stay informed.
Yeah, I'd like to just add thanks to you, Kate, for organizing the panel and for a thoughtful moderated discussion, and also to Bang, Lawrence, and Julia for your expertise, your insights. I think it's been helpful to everyone. Uh, thanks for all of you for joining us. Obviously, this is a complex issue and it's very personal for all of us. So I think together as we have civil dialogue and work together, we hopefully can continue to advance a good, a smart decisions for the future of Dallas. So once again, thank all of you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.